every dawning tendency in her had been carefully directed toward it. All her interests and activities had been taught to center around it. She was like some rare flower grown for exhibition, a flower from which every bud had been nipped. She put back the dresses one by one, laying away with each some gleam of light, some note of laughter, some stray waft from the rosy shores of pleasure. Lily Bart, as much best we understand her, was brought up much as Edith Jones had been brought up, believing in the, uh, the uh, goal of the young woman was to marry well. She almost marries an American millionaire, but she can't quite put up with him. But she does believe that, that even though she herself is not, not very wealthy, Lily Bart, that by dressing well and acting well and poising herself well as she takes her seat and so on, she can win, win, win her way. But she can't quite do it. I think this is part of the, this is where another part of Edith Wharton comes in. Lily Bart cannot quite sell herself out the way she's been taught to do. And that's her destruction. For the House of Mirth, she made an absolute fortune. Uh, my great-grandfather, I think, wrote her in a letter that never in his experience had a book sold more briskly. Uh, it was published in 1905, is that correct? I'm a little hazy on dates. She wrote so many books. But 1905, House of Mirth, uh, she made the equivalent today in pre-tax dollars of a million dollars on the House of Mirth. I mean, it would be in a league with uh, Jacqueline Suzanne or or Sidney Sheldon, or any great commercial, or Stephen King. I mean, she would cringe at these analogies. But the, my point is that these were sales and royalties equivalent to a great commercial writer, not a quote unquote literary writer. With the coming of real success, um, Teddy began very understandably, from my point of view, to get uh, edgy and restless, to go off more and more often on his hunting trips and, and fishing trips, uh, and to be harder to deal with and to get insomnia. And finally, over the next years, became really what we'd call a manic depressive, long periods of freezing melancholy, followed by a kind of madness, and finally to the point where he embezzled $50,000 of her money and set up a housekeeping in Boston with a mistress. But that was the later, later part of the marriage. She seems to have been somebody th that resisted the, the, the counsel or even the urge to, oh, to I cut think and run. She, I think she woke up to the fact that she'd married an ass, and she wasn't going to take his advice on anything. But that, I, don't, I mean, her commitment was to her marriage vow, to stay with him and to look after him. That's what she believed in, and that's what she found uh, it, it took a long time. She didn't have, a, it, it, as far as we know, her only extramarital affair until she was 47 years old. And that was, that, was, that was almost 20 years after she'd married. Was that Morton Fullerton? That was Morton Fullerton. February 21st, 1908. The other night at the theater, when you came into the box, I felt for the first time that indescribable current of communication flowing between myself and someone else. Felt it, I mean, uninterruptedly, securely, so that it penetrated every sense and every thought. And I said to myself, this must be what happy women feel. You know, Morton Fullerton was invited here by Edith Wharton at the urging, or at, I might say the introduction of Henry James, who su suggested and urged her to receive him. And he came and visited her at the Mount. And uh, the two of them, as was typical of Edith, he was invited on a motor flight in the afternoon to go off with a picnic and travel through the countryside. And during the course of this particular motor flight, uh, I think that Edith became, Edith Wharton became aware of the fact that this was a man who had more to offer her than pure intellectual challenge. Twentieth April, nineteen o eight. Nothing else lives in me but you. I have no conscious existence outside the thought of you the feeling of you. I, who dominated life, stood aside from it so. How I am humbled. 
absorbed, without a shred of will or identity left. All I want is to be near you, to feel my hands in yours. He was a small man, a trivial man in many ways, but Henry James liked him enormously. But he was in trouble with both sexes. He was, uh, he was bisexual, and uh, he, got in, uh, he got in bad trouble with women and with men. He was, he was rather what they, what, they, what they call a cad. April, 1910. I seem not to exist for you. I don't understand. If I could lean on some feeling in you, a good and loyal friendship, if there's nothing else, then I could go on, bear things, write and arrange my life. I don't know what you want or what I am. You write to me like a lover, you treat me like a casual acquaintance. Which are you? What am I? My life was better before I knew you. She was unhappy in a straight extramarital relationship. She was brought up to not to believe in that. She felt and said somehow that any love, meaning heterosexual love relationship, outside of marriage is unsatisfactory. That's old New York speaking through Edith Wharton. And she felt that way about Fullerton. That's one of the several reasons that it came to an end. Dear Mr. Fullerton, you have, if they still survive, a few notes and letters of no value to your archives, but which happen to fill a deplorable lacuna in those of their writer. I shall be in Paris on Monday next, the 21st, for a day only, and I write to ask if you'd be kind enough to send them to me that day. Yours sincerely, E. Wharton. Morton Fullerton never did return her letters. Their relationship ceased to be sexual in 1910, but trailed on in a muted fashion for the rest of her life. Edith Wharton was left with the remnants of a marriage that had become, by 1911, somewhat impolite. That was the worst moment in terms of, of uh, exchanges of accusations and all that. Uh, it was also the moment when she wrote the story Ethan Frome, which was, uh, came out about that time. Then Ethan Frome is set in, uh, in a rural section of, of Massachusetts, in Starkfield, Massachusetts, and it's country people, and yet it's deeply reflecting her own life. Uh, she changed the genders around, as she did more often. In other words, uh, she deals with a, a, a person who's very unhappily married and is in love with somebody else, but staying with Teddy for the moment, Teddy appears as Edith Wharton's wife, Zenobia, who is full of complaints and accusations and claims of being misunderstood and mistreated. And, uh, and to some extent, Edith Wharton puts herself into the figure of, of Ethan Frome. And the, the, the drama is extremely intense. Who could be stirring in that silent house? He heard a step on the stairs. And again, for an instant, the thought of tramps tore through him. Then the door opened and he saw his wife. Against the dark background of the kitchen, she stood up tall and angular, one hand drawing a quilted counterpane to her flat breast while the other held a lamp. The light, on a level with her chin, drew out of the darkness her puckered throat and the projecting wrist of the hand that clutched the quilt and deepened fantastically the hollows and prominences of her high-boned face under its ring of crimping pins. To Ethan, still in the rosy haze of his hour with Matty, the sight came with the intense precision of the last dream before waking. He felt as if he had never before known what his wife looked like. She realized they had no future here to, at all. In fact, she told Teddy to do what he would, what he wanted to with the mount, and she returned to Paris on, um, of course, sailed to Paris, and uh, she asked him, though, not to make any final decision until she arrived in Paris. It was very distressing to her to receive a telegraph from him while she was at sea that he had sold them out. Edith, who was not uh, beyond telling little untruths, pretended she didn't know anything about it and she, that Teddy did it behind her back, but he didn't. He, he was, he was, she gave him the authority to do it. Nonetheless, it was a terrible loss to her, this wonderful place where she had come into herself. 
And, and meanwhile, she, she heard on all sides that Teddy was dashing around Europe with one woman and another, so she did, um, got documents uh, proving his uh, moments of infidelity and submitted them to a court in Paris, and she's granted a decree. I always loved the wording of the decree because he had engaged dans des relations adultères à Londres, Tante Monte Carlo. <laughs> Not only in London, but in Monte Carlo. He, he had been misbehaving himself. So <clears throat> she, was, she was free. Her marriage had been too concrete a misery to be surveyed philosophically. Her husband's personality seemed to be closing gradually in on her, obscuring the sky and cutting off the air till she felt herself shut up among the decaying bodies of her starved hopes. A sense of having been decoyed by some old world conspiracy into this bondage of body and soul filled her with despair. If marriage was the slow, lifelong acquittal of a debt contracted in ignorance, then marriage was a crime against human nature. She's a woman who wasn't meant to be happy. If you look at some of the early photographs, the starved look, of, the look of the hunger for love that one can see on Edith Wharton's face, but you also see an extremely intense child. You see the brow furrowed. You see the intensity. You see the rigidity of her body as she stands in these poses uh, at various moments in her life. So that she really was a woman who wasn't meant to be happy. But then she made something complex and beautiful out of her life. There's an idea of women's lives, the unchronicled story of women's lives, and women who didn't know uh, when they passed from their beds to their graves. And in a sense, this is very much uh, what Wharton says at the beginning of A Backward Glance. She talks about the, the story that won't be spoken, the stories of the women in her family, uh, the stories that she won't know. Edith Wharton is currently, and uh, I'm very happy to see it happen, currently a, a rather a heroine of American literary feminists. She herself was not an ideological feminist in any way. In fact, when she met ideological feminists once or twice, especially in England in the late 20s and 30s, she rather stared clear at them. They, they, they put her off or, or bored her. She was a feminist in the basic sense, which is that, I mean, what is a feminist really? It's a person who thinks that women matter, who thinks that women matter as much as men matter. And to me, that's the basic definition of a feminist. Her politics would not have made us happy today, but she certainly thought that women mattered. And because she did, she wrote novels that matter to women now. The sale of the Mount and the divorce from Teddy made an end to Edith Wharton's American life. In France, the gaze she still trained on old New York softened. The Age of Innocence, for which she won the Pulitzer Prize in 1921, was a gentle tragedy, not of death, but of disappointment. And The Buccaneers, which she left unfinished, was a fairy tale of loveless marriage and female sacrifice. Edith Wharton died in 1937 and was buried alone in a double plot in the Cimetière des Gonards in Versailles, near the grave of Walter Berry. And so death is not the end after all. In sheer gladness, she heard herself exclaiming aloud. Have you never really known what it is to live? The spirit of life asked her. I have never known, she replied, that fullness of life, which we all feel ourselves capable of knowing. Though my life has not been without scattered hints of it, like the scent of earth, which comes to one sometimes far out at sea, Coming up next tonight, we continue with the dramatization of The Buccaneers, 